Hi everybody, spring has sprung and it's time for episode 20 of Diversity of Life with me, Nasi. I don't know about you, but when I think about spring, the first thing that comes to mind is flowers. The colors, sights, smells, shapes, and varieties, there's just so many. But why do some plants produce flowers? Why do others not? And what's the goal? For this week's episode, I'm going to touch on all you need to know about the marvelous evolutionary trait of flowering. Flowers are the reproductive structure of flowering plants. There are hundreds of thousands of different kinds of flowers, many with different means of reproducing. Generally, the flowers are the sites of pollen or sperm and ovary or egg production, meaning that they're the conduit for sexual reproduction with other plants and sometimes they're part of self-reproduction within a single flower. When fertilized, the flower loses its petals and transforms into a fruit or a fleshy body with seeds in the middle. Flowering plants refer to a huge group of plants, the angiosperms. Approximately 242 million years ago, we think that these flowering plants branched off from gymnosperms. The gymnosperms are plants like Christmas trees. These are plants that are evergreens that do not produce fruit, rather they have a naked seed like pine cones. But this story of divergence between the angiosperms and gymnosperms is a bit weird. Even today, the fossil record is lacking. We don't know which group of gymnosperms or exact event is the conduit for this mass diversification of the angiosperms. There are numerous theories about how the angiosperms came to be. One is that a species of seed-bearing fern was the common ancestor. This potential common ancestor could have had multiple whole genome duplications. This would have supported the traits such as more encased seeds in the form of fruit. Another theory is that they evolved on an island. Islands are usually diversification hotspots because of their limited competition and unique niches. Because fruit is actually a really efficient means of seed dispersal, they could have dispersed off the island via animal transport. There's even a theory that there was strong selective pressure for fruit because of the large abundance of herbivorous dinosaurs. But we're still trying to find out which one of these is the most accurate. During Charles Darwin's time, flowering plants were actually a huge source of criticism to the theory of evolution. With flowering plants' massive diversity and the lack of fossil records supporting the connection between gymnosperms and angiosperms, many questioned how it was possible. Darwin even called it the abominable mystery. However, today we're closer to that connection and know that for certain, 160 million years ago, we have concrete evidence of flowers and fossils. During the Cretaceous, 120 million years ago, Flowering plants became widespread around the world, and 60 million years ago, flowering plants replaced conifers as the dominant tree species. But how did just one group of plants overtake the entire world and speciate over 400,000 times in just 150 to 200 million years? Symbiosis. Fruit. Fruit are one of the marvel success stories of nature. They're highly nutritious while being sweet and addictive to animals. Animals worldwide quickly depended on fruit for food, and that meant more efficient dispersal for the plant. As the animal eats the fruit, they take in the seeds, they move around, and then later they'll poop out the seeds somewhere else and the plants can grow. The symbiosis between flowering plants and animals is astounding. There are flowers that can only be pollinated by certain insects, like bumblebees and tomato plants. Close to home, Hummingbirds have evolved long beaks and tongues in tandem with trumpet-shaped flowers to reach the nectar that they contain. Some fruit have evolved so closely with a specific animal that they need each other to reproduce. This is the case with fig wasps and fig trees. The pleasant smells that flowers and fruit produce attracts all manner of organisms, like us. In fact, scientists at Rutgers University in New Jersey have noticed a new symbiosis between flowering plants and humans. In an experiment by Haviland Jones, Rosario, Wilson, and McGuire from 2005, when flowers were presented to men and women, their mood was noted to improve for days. In addition, 
there was a desire to have more of that plant around. The scientists suggested that the plants might be exploiting an emotional niche, that if they make humans happy, they are more likely to survive. We've even seen this selective pressure in nature over the past couple thousand years. Some plants that used to be rare are now common due to humans' preference and, naturally, have selected for color and pleasant smells to avoid removal. Ugh, are flowers trying to control us? Trying to placate us by making us happy and inevitably take over the world? Okay, okay, okay. This is not becoming a conspiracy theory video. Nevertheless, this close relationship that animals have with flowering plants is deeply ingrained in nature now. They are an irreplaceable food resource for most animals, making up 80% of our own agriculture. I couldn't imagine a world without flowers, not just because of their importance for food, but because how much they brighten up any scene. I mean, what hummingbird doesn't love a good flower? As always, I want to hear from you. What is your favorite flower? Do you know any fun flower facts? Are you in a gardening mode like I am this spring? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked what you heard here, please hit the like button. If you want to see more, subscribe. And if you want to see more of my furry antics, follow me on Twitter. I hope you're all enjoying the warm weather and flowers as much as I am. See you later.